Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we're happy to be again in the uh, upper left side of Manhattan here uh, with uh, a distinguished uh, public intellectual, Stanley Aronowitz, and also with uh, Jim Vretos, who is a sociologist and a criminologist. Um, and trying to spark a discourse to figure out what's going on in our country, educationally, culturally, politically. Uh, it is our great honor to bring you today uh, the distinguished professor Stanley Aronowitz, who is also an author of over 25 books, a person who uh, Cornell West has referred to as a towering public intellectual, and also the most enchanting public intellectual he's ever met. Um, and so uh, part of this is going to be to let Stanley be Stanley, and to let Stanley give his his critiques and his commentary on what's happening in the educational, political, cultural uh, situation today, because very few people connect the dots as well as Stanley does. Um, and uh, I am an educator. I am a professor at uh, uh, Essex County College in Newark. I'm an adjunct professor of English. And uh, to sort of prepare for this lecture, I went back into The Knowledge Factory, which is a book Stanley wrote 10 years ago. and. Um, you know, it's really disturbing to see how, for example, Stanley points out that with all the adjunct professors now, it's very hard to uh, have any time for any kind of critical learning or, or writing, and I'm experiencing that as an adjunct professor. Uh, when we look at the corporatization of our, of our society and of the educational system, this morning I saw on the Sunday morning talk show uh, Mr. Bill Gates, who Stanley refers to as our Secretary of Education, <laughs> our, our actual secretary. Forget Arnie Duncan. He's only the assistant to, to Bill Gates. And what was Bill Gates talking about? He was talking about math, math scores, and we got to get the math scores so we can beat the Chinese. That was all he was he ca cared about. So uh, we are going to pass the microphone over and, and, and to let Stanley give his discourse for maybe about 15 minutes or so. He could just talk off the top, you know. Then we're going to we're going to have uh, Jim is going to give his commentary and questions. It'll come back to me for a little bit and then go back to Stanley. This is mostly a lecture by Stanley, but in a dialogical format that Jim and I will also have input on it. And we are again very blessed to have one of the greatest public intellectuals of our time, Stanley Aronowitz. Thank you. John, I was glad that you started with uh, Bill Gates and education. One of the most disturbing uh, features of education is that everybody who now thinks about reform of the educational system, the latest being the Robin Hood Foundation, which is about to uh, study educational innovation in the United States, one of their major um, criteria for determining whether education is moving ahead or moving backward or stagnating is uh, the maintenance of standardized testing. And the Robin Hood Foundation, uh, which has done very good work in helping to eradicate poverty in the United States, as, as far as uh, private foundations can actually uh, affect it, has now decided that they're going to get involved in education as a means of doing away with poverty, but they've gotten off on the wrong foot. And the wrong foot is, uh, is standardized testing, is the emphasis on math and science at the expense of literature, at the expense of uh, philosophy of various kinds, at the expense of, uh, of, of a social uh, knowledge uh, of the world within which we live. Um, and it's, it's, it shows the degree to which schooling has become subservient to the corporate order. Uh, because what they are preparing students at all levels, at the elementary and secondary school level, at college level, at graduate level, to actually perform uh, the tasks that are necessary in the corporate uh, workplace. I would have, would have at one point thought it would be both the uh, private and the public workplace, but the public workplace is being cut down like a, uh, a tree in the forest for, for firewood. Um, uh, you talk about this morning's talk shows. Um, I, I read in this morning's paper a huge piece I mean, front page in the New York Times uh, on Sunday, uh, March 15, 2014, where we now can see they recognize that we are in the era of the privatization 
of higher education. We are in the period of privatization of research, of the privatization of science itself. And, and the headline is the privatization of science. Multi-billionaires and most of them from the Gates high-tech sector are putting a lot of money into, into research uh, in the universities as well as outside the universities with the aim of gearing most of our research away from basic research, which would be uh, the discovery of new knowledge that will help us understand the world within which we live in the largest cosmic sense, uh, in favor of, uh, of products, of, uh, of products that can be used for profit. And uh, this is not simply confined to, uh, to science and technology. This is confined, this is all over the place. And I think we have to be very careful before we say educational reform anymore, because we have to be specific. What do we mean by educational reform? And my view of educational reform would be that at the elementary and the secondary school levels, as well as at the levels of, um, of um, higher education, we would place equal footing in uh, literature, in uh, the arts, in philosophy. And when people say, but in New York City, as well as in the rest of the country, there's no philosophy at the level of public schooling. I say, I, I think that's a mistake. I think high school should have philosophy courses. And that would not only uh, uh, employ the f unemployed and part-time philosophers who are partially unemployed anyway, and there are many, many of them, and social theorists, uh, but it would actually help students locate themselves in a world which is so bewilderingly moving fast ahead that in many cases they can't understand it. And that's really what we should be concerned with. Uh, I am uh, teaching this semester a group of working adults. Um, at the City University, and although they are very bright, uh, when I say they're very bright, they're working people who have actually been able to perform jobs in the public sector and, uh, uh, and do them well. Their background, uh, and they're youngish, they're in their 20s and 30s, their background in American history, in U.S. history, in history of the Americas generally, in world history, in history as such, is really in many ways impoverished. And that's not their fault. It's because the schools have really begun to surrender their responsibility in the humanities, their responsibility in the social sciences, and their uh, uh, move towards instrumental math and science learning. The, the, the other issue that I think is connected to the educational issue is that we have a national administration that says, uh, and, I, and I'm quoting my grandmother's phrase, every Monday and Thursday, you know, in, in Yiddish it's Montek and Donnerstag, you know, every Monday and Thursday, the national administration declares that we're in the midst of a turnaround in the economy. And that turnaround in the economy is now signaled by the fact that our unemployment rate, official unemployment rate has gone down to 6.7%. And that, uh, therefore, we only have, I use the word only uh, ironically, we only have uh, some 12.5 million people unemployed, and 4 million of them are officially unemployed for longer than is considered normal. That is to say, longer than half a year. Half a year. Um, but the truth of the matter is, and they also say this in the um, 15th paragraph of the, of the article, or uh, if it's on television, almost never, that many of the reasons, that one of the main reasons that the unemployment rate has gone down is because large numbers of people have stopped looking for work. That is to say, they, they're living with their parents, young people are living with their parents forever and ever, or they're 55 years old or more, or 45 years old or more in some cases, and are, and are depending upon one inadequate income of a partner. They can't get a job. Their partner still has a job, so they're able to, uh, to, to retire because they're tired of looking, literally, because there's no jobs, tired of looking for work that doesn't exist. And it doesn't matter whether you're a, a, a college graduate. It doesn't matter whether you're a, um, a community college graduate. Uh, the truth of the matter is that many people who are 
young people who are community college and college graduates, the only work that they can find, it's not jobs, is work in the fast food industry, is work in the big boxes like Walmart and uh, outside of New York City, and um, uh, Target inside of New York City, and the department stores, which will not uh, employ them for 30 uh, uh, weeks out of the year, because if they employ them for 30 weeks, or, or 30 hours, I'm sorry, 30 hours a week, that's what I meant, 30 hours a week, what will happen is that they will, that the, that the company's got to pay health insurance, or they have to enroll for health insurance, and the company has to participate. So they employ them for 28 hours a week, mm -hmm. and then they lay them off for the rest of the, uh, of, of the work week. So we're in this very very uh, peculiar situation where, aside from programs like this, and a few places on the radio, progressive radio, and, uh, and um, um, other uh, odd programs, sometimes on NPR, um, sometimes on, uh, on uh, um, Pacifica, except for those, small, those places, you really don't have access, as a, as, a, as a citizen of this country, you don't have access to knowledge about what is going on in the economy. And as far as we should understand, as we approach the 2014 congressional elections, nobody in office with any kind of political power and nobody in the private sector and the corporate private sector has come up with an industrial policy. That is to say, has come up with a serious program for expanding jobs. But the good news is that increasingly, some commentators, uh, Paul Krugman in the New York Times, for example, every Monday and Friday, he, does, he misses Thursday. And he's, by the way, coming to the City University to be a professor. Uh, Paul Krugman is actually pointing out that um, unless we have a serious jobs uh, program and a program for increasing the minimum wage and wages generally, we have no chance for a turnaround. He doesn't Let's talk. Let's forget our, our comrade Richard Wolf here. Uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, Rick Wolf says this chair. That's true. <laughs> Rick Wolf says this regularly, but I'm talking about the mainstream. I mean, Rick has gotten a lot of uh, publicity for somebody who is a critic. Right. But Krugman is not essentially a critic. He's right. a critic of policy. He's not a critic of the system. Mm -hmm. He's not a critic of capitalism. Rick Wolf is a wonderful critic of capitalism and says, you know, says the truth. Unfortunately, he says the truth not necessarily as the biblical phrase is to power. Um, and we wish that was the case. Uh, so we are facing this kind of a situation with respect to the economy. Uh, I want to just mention this, a third thing. We talk about, you talk about this is a program that deals with the problem of the arts. Um, we are seeing, despite the increasing number of Americans and people living in the United States who are not necessarily citizens, uh, reading. There's a growth of reading in the United States, and I think that's wonderful. People reading novels, people reading nonfiction, um, people reading um, uh, magazines and uh, newspapers are going down the drain, we know that, but they're reading uh, more than they did 10 years ago, and that's good news. The bad news, is that they're buying most of their books from Amazon. And what's happening is that uh, locally based bookstores, in many instances, are shutting down. Now, in the city of New York, one of the more prominent of the local bookstores is Shakespeare and Company on Broadway between uh, um, Waverly Place and Washington Place. It is shutting down. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, as, it's as if, um, you know, on the Upper West Side of New York, we suddenly discovered Zabar's is going to shut down to sell bagels, you know. It's the same kind of, of loss. But, the law, but, the, but at the same time, which is very interesting, is that in Brooklyn, where there's been a growth of both population and of, um, of, um, of gentrification, there is an uh, expansion of bookstores. Uh, so that it's a very mixed bag. However, around the country, the, the, the number of local bookstores which 
at one time were places where people like myself, as well as Rick Wolf, could go in and give a talk and have a discussion. There are still are a few, like uh, Blue Stockings and, and, and some others, um, book culture on the Upper West Side. But essentially, those, that, those venues for having conversations about the state of the economy, about the arts, about politics, about education, those venues are declining. And it's very, very sad. At this, Amazon is one of the multi-billion air companies that is sponsoring this new emphasis on science and technology, which I mentioned before. Um, and Amazon is now beginning to become something like a behemoth. And the last, term, last time we heard the term behemoth, I want to say this advisedly, was when Franz Neumann wrote his great book on the Nazi uh, uh, society, which was called Behemoth. And there was a Nazi behemoth. Behemoth? Be behemoth, yeah. Okay. Well, we have different, we, we have different pronunciations. Okay. You're an English teacher, so you pronounce things <laughs> correctly. from the Bronx. Yeah, that's right. I'm from the Bronx. From the Bronx. Yeah, <laughs> so so you, you pronounce things correctly. The behemoth that, uh, that we're seeing is the behemoth of the, of the multi-billionaire, not only individuals, that's separate, but the multi-billion corporations in the high-tech sector which are appropriating both public and private money for their own benefit and against the interests of students in the education system on the pretense that what they're doing is helping kids to become much more competitive in a job market which to a large extent doesn't exist. So I think, I think I've said enough to start with, yes. uh, but I, I, I guess I could add only one thing, and I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's equally important. But it's not something we normally discuss. Um, I happen to have a few bucks in my pocket whenever I want to see an opera, whenever I want to see a performance of a, um, especially a modern opera, which I like, I like to see, like Billy Budd by Brent, Benjamin Britten, which played at, the, at BAM, I saw that. If you have the bottom ticket at, the, at BAM, which is in Brooklyn, that's not the Metropolitan Opera. If you have a bottom ticket for, uh, uh, for an opera, in New York City, it costs forty-five dollars. Bottom ticket. Bottom ticket, and it goes up to a hundred and some dollars. And when you get to the Metropolitan Opera, it goes up to two hundred and something dollars. And sometimes you can't even get in because the season tickets, which are bought by the large corporate right. firms, law firms as well as uh, uh, production firms and corporate headquarters. Those tickets are gobbled up in advance, and their employees, top employees, get to sit, that, sit in, the, um, in the seats, and ordinary people cannot afford it. And that's going on in terms of plays, it's going on in terms of, of opera, it's going on in terms of everything. What? Yankee Stadium. Yankee Stadium. Well, the one good thing about Yankee Stadium is the Yankees, as the Yankees lose, and the Mets lose, the the hundred dollar tickets go back for twenty bucks, especially during the week. That's I don't know true. About twenty. But well, right, tw yeah. no, twenty five. Twenty. five. During 20 the week. Okay. Yeah, during the, during the week. I didn't say yeah, on the not, weekend. Yeah, uh, but you can't even get into the ball game. Right. But it. But I'm talking about the arts. I right. mean, uh, and the arts are are have become essentially an, an upper middle class to to ruling class um, 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 uh, benefit, and. P working people and people who are fighting for uh, daily bread right. cannot afford the arts. And uh, time, in a way, they're what? working themselves to death. They That's right. But let me, but let me say this, Jim, and you should really have a, a, a historical perspective. My great uncle, my mother's uncle, mm. had a season. He was a garment worker. It was a skilled garment worker, but he was a garment worker, and he, was, uh, he had a season ticket to the Metropolitan Opera. And as my mother described the season ticket, and I can describe it to you in a minute, mm. the season ticket, the two season tickets he had in the Metropolitan Opera were next to God. Mm. Now that meant it was way up yeah. in, the, uh, yeah. in the upper tiers. Now that's all right. And it didn't cost that much. Uh, Whenever he didn't like a singer or a, an opera that was being performed, he would give the tickets to my mother. Right. My mother would take me at the age of nine and ten right, right. to the to the opera, drag me to the opera. I'll never forget going to the opera to 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 uh, see Wagner's Ring Cycle. I mean, ten years old Ring Cycle is a little heavy, but it was affordable, 
And then they had standing room. Mm. At that time, the standing room was for five dollars, and it went way up. When I was a, a, a young adult um, uh, in the '60s, it went way up to ten dollars. You could stand and watch a whole opera for ten dollars. I mean, but Radio what, City too. Yeah, Radio City. Yeah, yeah, that's even the, maybe even Yiddish theater. Well, I never went to the no, Yiddish. But I mean, you're, you're, my parents, yeah, no, my parents were English. Yeah, my yeah, parents were English speaking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, their pa well, my mother knew Yiddish, and my father broke in Yiddish. They were both English speaking. They never took yeah. me to the Yiddish. Okay. So th that that's what's happening to the arts. The arts are becoming class specific. The education system is becoming class specific. Yeah. Higher education in the public sector is being maneuvered into to essentially a, 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 a technological uh, fix. If you want to know something about Dostoevsky, and you want to know something about Charles Dickens, you don't get a, 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 an education to a large extent increasingly, not to say it's completely bad. You don't get an education in public schools. You're getting a, you have to go to a private school, and that, that is beyond the, uh, the uh, 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 affordability for many, many, many students, and many of them can't get into the private schools anyway. So I think we're in, we're in a, a serious crisis. What is at stake? And that's the last point, obviously. What's at stake is whether our society and our culture can ever be a democratic culture if people do not have access to every aspect of that culture the literature of that culture, the politics of that culture, mm -hmm. the technology, the science as well. But if they don't have access to the arts, then the imagination suffers crucially. Wow. And, uh, we'll pass it on. Okay, thank you, Stanley. So I'm gonna pass the microphone on to Jim Retos now, a sociologist at John Jay College, who also has a radio show called The Rebbe, The Radical, and The Rev. And he's gonna give his uh, reflections on what Stanley said and uh, add his own thoughts. Yeah, re reflections, but also, I I'd like to give and take, too, because Stanley's been on my show a couple of times. I love talking with him. love talking with you, John. So I, I, it, this is not some sort of formal lecture. But as you were talking, it just struck me so much how this is, this is uh, so much part of the criminal justice system as well. Mm. Uh, the privatization of prisons, these companies like GEO, who, who are uh, having all-time profits um, on the stock exchange, uh, increasingly becoming more and more influential in our criminal justice system, making sure that they have all beds, all uh, cells filled so that they can make more of a profit. Um, we go to Rikers Island any random day and you talk to a, an inmate, his reading level score, third grade, fourth grade at best. Um, and yet I've taught in prisons before and there's such a need, there is such a, a desire, a thirst for learning. Uh, we know our colleague Cornell West teaches at uh, Rahway Prison every, every Friday. Yeah. A course on philosophy. Yes. History of philosophy, I think it is. 150 sure. uh, inmates there who, who just highlight of their, their day. Um, so there's such a need. Jobs, the connection between jobs and criminal justice. We've created a parole probation system which is impossible to fulfill all the rules and regulations. And, and as the crime rates go down, incarceration rates still go up because of the infractions that these parole officers and probation officers are, are fixing onto these, uh, these, these individuals. What they basically need is jobs. They need education and jobs. And we're not talking about that as well in that field. So we see it in a more extreme example, the excessive, uh, the, the, the the racism, the, the classism that exists there writ large in the prison system is most magnified. Same thing you're talking about here. Um, so what to do? The, the search for a progressive or, if you will, radical or leftist alternative to this. You've talked about it in terms of the sociological imagination, right? That, you, that you've gleaned in a sense from your, your wonderful book on C. Wright Mills. Um, where does that imagination lead us in terms of organizational structure for the left? Uh, I'd like to throw it back to you on that. 
Oh, okay. I wanted to say a few words. Uh, no. I just wanted to read a little excerpt from Stanley's book, The Knowledge Factory, uh, which has to do with uh, social scientists and how these are the people who are supposed to be looking out for the public good, and it seems like their analysis of things has become narrower and narrower and more tied to a corporate agenda. Uh, and I'm talking about people like uh, anthropologists and sociologists and uh, Except for Jim Vretos. Um, Certainly economists. And, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole, everybody. Let's see here. Uh, I, I had it, I had it here. Corporate academic world. Yes. Now here, this is, here's what it says. Okay. The social sciences have increasingly veered toward the natural sciences in their self-conscious subordination to the prevailing order. Their preoccupation with questions of research methods by which to measure public opinion have made them part of the barometric orientation of American politics. Social scientists have become the technicians of social control, providing the scientific legitimacy for social, education, military, and other areas of policy. With few exceptions, the garden variety social scientists, sociologists, economists, and political scientists are the intellectual servants of power. Like natural scientists, they are prone to follow the money. Among the social science disciplines, economists are virtually tied at the hip to corporate and government bureaucracies. If the others have not yet enjoyed this intimacy, for many practitioners, it is a condition devoutly to be wished for. So they're all trying to get that money, that do re mi, and they're losing sight of the fact that part of intellect, uh, uh, an important part of intellectual life is to actually change the culture, to think about a world that might be, not the world that we're living in now. And um, this also uh, came to my mind when I read George Lukács. I had the great privilege of reading George Lukács, who was a Marxist economist, and I got to read him because Stanley invited me to sit in his, on his class in George Lukács, which he informed me is probably the only place in North America <laughs> teaching George Lukács now, right? Uh, to get a, a Marxist anal analysis. Uh, we have a picture of Karl Marx that hangs in the other room in this wonderful uh, apartment on the liberal Upper West Side. Um, so I'm thinking in terms of how do we get back our critical intelligence. Uh, there's another uh, uh, passage in that book, The Knowledge Factory, where Stanley says how adjunct professors don't have time f to read, to write, because they're always scrambling from one class to another. I want to thank my lovely wife, Claudia, who's filming us now, because if she didn't have a day job, <laughs> I would not be able to write, you know? And um, I, I just finished a book on education, which is called Teaching Under the Radar. Confessions of a Secret Agent of Change, and I quote from Stanley in this book, and what I say basically is in order to teach well today, you have to be a rebel. And it often gets you in trouble with the authorities of where you're teaching. So the qu question is, how do we, well, you know, we, how do we create spaces, radical spaces, alternative spaces? Our viewers who are watching us now, Stanley, who are caught up in that corporate grind, who maybe wish they had more of a, a, a life, a humanistic life, you know? How, what, people who've been, you know, sort of majoring in business and marketing because they feel like that's how you have to make a living, but they've missed all of the ideas that we learned and people like me, because of we're around people like you, and we're, you know, you gave that wonderful course on the history of the left at the Breck Forum a couple of years ago, which was magnificent, and I wish that that could go out to more people. So how, going forward, can we repair these deficiencies? Because my fear is that when you have a public out there who has not been educated critically, they're just going to buy whatever malarkey the two-party system is dishing out, you know, the Democrats versus the Republicans. And on top of all that, I want to throw in, what do you think about Bernie Sanders, that he said he might run for president in 2016, a socialist? You raise a number of issues, uh, John, and uh, I think the first, my first response connects what you said to what Jim asked, and, I, and that is, what do we do? Um, if the left, if r critical thinkers like yourselves and myself and others that we know, do not create their own institutions, then the possibility of actually changing the official institutions like 
the schools, for example, uh, or the arts, uh, or the uh, media, are, is almost nil. Mm -hmm. As individuals, we can teach good courses, and I hope I teach good courses, yes. and you do, and, and Jim does. But unless we have an organization that does a couple of things, and I'll name them in a minute, uh, we're going to be essentially uh, uh, swimming upstream or uh, uh, replicating the old uh, uh, myth of the Sisyphus, pushing a huge rock up, up a mountain. Um, the organizations, the institutions that we require uh, in the first place is an organization that can be multifaceted. Uh, educational institutions, institutions of the arts. There used to be a time when, uh, aside from uh, a, a few stations, the unions in this country, which were progressive unions especially, had over a hundred radio stations. Whoa. Over a, and now there are 12 union-sponsored radio stations left. The unions have, uh, w with their diminished membership, and I don't have to rehearse that one, everybody knows about it, uh, representing 7% of the private sector labor force, even though a third of the public sector labor force, the unions gave $450 million to the Obama uh, campaign and the Democratic Party in 2012. Now, a fraction of that, I mean not a small fraction, but a, perhaps 20, 30 million dollars could buy small stations all over the country. Um, the, the unions could revive what they gave up essentially 15 to 20 years ago, complete, almost completely, an educational program. They don't have an educational program for their own members, and they don't have an educational program for the public. They just lost a very big election in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, at the uh, at the uh, Volkswagen plant, even though the company was favorable to the union, because there was enormous uh, propaganda campaign by political uh, figures of the state of Tennessee and elsewhere, uh, conservative figures against the union, and the problem was that the union did not mobilize uh, pro-union forces and did not have the institutional base to be able to do that. Uh, they didn't even try, however, and what 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 they need to recognize the unions as well as the left is that until we have our own Sta uh, radio stations, our own press, our own um, um, organization that can raise money uh, to be able to finance these things, then we're going to be sunk. Mm. And the problem is there's an awful lot of young people who recognize that the system is somehow wrong. Uh, young people, I mean between ages of 18 and uh, roughly 35 or 40. But there's been a, such a strong mm. reaction against organization. And part of it is because of the history of the left itself, and part of it is because of the betrayals that they perceive uh, at the, uh, of the Democratic Party, outside of the Obama campaign, which had a lot of overtones that were part, apart from the Democratic Party, that they won't consider the notion of organization. But, uh, but this is the next step. If we have organizations, then we can sponsor schools like the Brecht Forum on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. If we have organization, we can make sure that BAI doesn't go down and the progressive radio na network prospers. If we have organization, we would have a national weekly newspaper. We don't have a national we I, I once wrote for I, the Guardian, not the British Guardian, the American Guardian from 1968 to 1970. I had a weekly column in the Guardian, a weekly column, and it raised it, it reached 35,000 people, many of whom were activists, and I commented on everything. And that paper no longer exists, and we don't have anything to replace it. And it, literally since the early 90s, there hasn't even been an attempt to have a genuine weekly, because if we don't have a weekly paper, even though we need social media, I understand how important that is, how mm -hmm. Facebook and, and, and Twitter and all that should be exploited, obviously, as people are doing. But unless we have a weekly newspaper, then certainly people are going to be subject to the interpretations of the mainstream, which are only rarely accurate, as, as, as we've discovered. And uh, 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 so the next step is to have that conversation. It, that organization does not have to be sectarian. We have a lot of little sectarian uh, groups. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a broad left-wing organization that says, look, A, 
Um, we, we, we believe that the system that presently exists is not viable in serving the needs of most people, that we need a, 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 a revolutionary or a radical transformation of the social system, that capitalism has to be significantly changed, and that the basis of that has to be a small d democratic ownership and control of large resources in society. I am not for the, public, for, for the socialization of growing tomatoes. I think private uh, growing of tomatoes and many other small vegetables are better. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the huge manufacturing uh, plants, the banking system. The banking system essentially runs the, runs the government. And so that's not a private system any longer. It's private ownership of public resources. When they got in trouble, all they did was say to both George W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama and in their administrations, we are in trouble. We won billions upon billions of billions. dollars. Billions. No, 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 no. Billions oh, upon oh, billions oh. Got, got up to a trillion dollars. The first one was $700 billion. Oh. And uh, the first one from, from Bush. Um, and uh, the second one was another uh, 700 billion from Obama, but then it started to dribble into trillions, and that, and 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 we have a right to ask uh, for for that kind of di distribution of uh, of those resources, which are our money. Mm. They took our money and gave it to them. We have to say, look, the banks should not be private banks anymore. That's uh, not. Uh, we have a public we have a public uh, banking yeah. system in many other countries in the world. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. communism, but it's mm -hmm. it's it's public uh, it's it's public resource. So that's the first step. This and and that's a big step to have this organization that can start making these kinds of demands for a shorter work week, for guaranteed basic income, for a much much higher minimum wage. They're not going to do any of the above. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the two major political parties until they feel the threat, and we do not now. With all due respect to how smart we are and how public we are, and mm. there's Cornell West and there's Chris Hedges and there's people like that, we don't constitute a threat. And until and unless we constitute a threat, nothing's going to happen. Now, I think, this, I think it's going to be hard for a lot of people who are on the left to tolerate differences. And I want to just pose one difference that is important. My uh, partner and wife, Ellen Willis, whose book uh, is just coming out called The Essential Ellen Willis, and I lived together for 25 years. My position towards Israel was extremely critical. Uh, I thought, I, I actually think the concept of a Jewish state is a problem, not a, not a solution to the problem that Jews face uh, from the Holocaust on. I was for a binational state, and I still am. I don't think that the Jewish state in the long run is, is viable. Zionism is not my, my cup of tea. Ellen was not a Zionist, but she was a partisan of Israel. And we lived in the same household and <laughs> ate the same meals and slept <laughs> in the same bed. So we could live together, no, I'm serious, and have differences, and we didn't have to call each other names in order to maintain our differences. The trouble with the left today is that if you disagree with me on Israel, or you disagree with me on Iraq, or you disagree with me on something else, then I can't work with you, that's silly. The main problem that we have, and I'm going to take up the next problem that you raised, the main problem we have is that we don't recognize more what unites us than what divides us. What unites us is that we want to change the system. And if Bernie Sanders, a senator from Vermont, a lifelong socialist, who doesn't describe himself that way anymore, John, he calls himself an independent, if he wants to run for president on a crazy, uh, radical, uh, uh, platform, I would be absolutely thrilled to support him. I don't think it's going to change the world if he runs, but I do think it will say to the people of the, of the United States that no, we don't have to settle anymore. We have somebody who would, to a large extent, not entirely, but to a large extent, uh, represent the aspirations of, 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 of a majority of people whose interests are being sold down the river. So that, that's my attitude about, about Bernie Sanders, and I think, uh, I hope he goes ahead with it. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard for him, but I do think, of course, what they're going to say is, Oh, uh, Hillary Clinton, who is the likely Democratic candidate in 2016, Hillary Clinton is so much better than anybody the Republicans will put together. I have to say something about Hillary Clinton. As far as I'm concerned, Hillary Clinton is a warmonger. She never saw, a, uh, she never saw an invasion like 
Iraq, for example, that she didn't support. She has never been a, a supporter of, 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 of peace. She's never been a supporter of the interests of the, of the colonial and former colonial peoples. She is a, a, a spokesperson for the established war machine. A at the same time, she obviously is, like most Democrats today, a supporter of abortion rights, and she's a supporter of, uh, of gay marriage. But when it comes to you know, sharp increases of the minimum wage or it comes to a sharp transformation of the public institutions like the banks and so on, I don't hear her saying one thing that I can support. I agree with you totally on, on the need for these alternative institutions. I would hope that this salon can become a focal point for the left and for progressives. As you know, John and Stanley, I, I have a radio show, The Rebbe, The Radical, and The Rev. Okay. I'm not The Rebbe, I'm not The Rev. <laughs> the radical. Okay, but we've had, and John, you've been in the network of spiritual progressives. Michael Lerner has been involved in the program. Stanley's been on. I'm having Alan Dershowitz. I've had Khalidi on. I've had uh, just the last couple. I have a piece of tea coming out. I know you do, and I wanted to get that. All right, but, uh, but the point is, sure, we can disagree, and we need to have this as a form. We need, I would like this very much to be on a regular basis. People like yourself and a core group of people that can come, and this will be a safe house for us to talk about these left progressive issues and debate among ourselves and have other people from uh, into the audience here that can support us and that can uh, we can have this critical debate. Um, so I would like this very much to happen. I also believe that the, the academic world needs to turn to alternative visions and critical resistance and, and, and a sociological imagination. I, along with my colleague Doug Tompkins, are involved in organizing the formerly incarcerated, the families of the formerly incarcerated, uh, the re so-called reentry industry uh, into a movement that can apply pressure from the bottom up. I think that's also crucial because most of my colleagues at John Jay and elsewhere in the academic world are, are basically figureheads, as you point out, and they're decent people by and large for the establishment, their basically career. So we need this alternative vision. I'm all for a increased discussion on this and, and forming these alternative institutions, including the newspaper, including all forms of social media that needs to happen. Okay, we got about 15 minutes left, and uh, I want to give Stanley the bulk of the time that's left. I just want to say a few reflections that I have now. Uh, one being uh, the fact that, uh, just to give some context to people about who Stanley Aronowitz is, Stanley Aronowitz was part of a intellectual uh, a cadre, I guess. He was at the tail end of what was known as the Frankfurt School. When Stanley's book came out, False Promises, in the early 70s, it came to the attention of a Herbert Marcuse, who was one of the great intellectuals of all time and uh, on the left. And he was at the time in California. He invited Stanley out to California to teach. And, and Stanley also got to meet Hannah Arendt at that time, who was a... Or Hannah Arendt in New York. Oh, in New York. He, after he, my book came After, but he did meet Hannah Arendt. Now, Hannah Arendt a film about her life came out recently, a documentary. And I got inspired by that film because they were having these salons and discussions right in this neighborhood. We are on Riverside Drive, and Jim informs me that Hannah Arendt lived about five blocks north of here. So we're trying to reconnect and replug into that deep, radical, intellectual space. Um, now, you mentioned Paul Krugman. I think it's a good thing that Krugman will be at the same university as Stanley, because so. may, maybe then, you know, who knows? That could open up some conversations and dialogues, and and, and uh, maybe I, we could bring Krugman here. I mean, I see him when he's on those Sunday morning shows, and they try to crowd him out, and David Brooks is always trying to get the last word in. But I, he does have a more progressive side that might be nourished and nurtured forward. Now, uh, to say one more thing about getting this out to a wider audience, which I think is crucial. Rick Wolf, who is a uh, radical economist, uh, did get on the Charlie Rose show last year, and I think that does give hope that we could bring this out to a larger audience and, and maybe get Stanley on to Charlie Rose. Or, but, but you know, um, and, and also I think in terms of money, I think that's the practical thing that we have to keep in mind. My new radio show is called New Bottom Line, and it's to spark an ethical transformation of corporate culture and to create a bottom line in our society that doesn't just value profit, but values people and the planet, right? And also to help the left get its money act together. Because I want to pose a vision of having a TV show that is genuinely critical and that gets the kind of audience as a CNBC. 
so. The first, the, uh, my first comment is you're not going to transform corporate culture. Um, and John, you and I have had the, we've gone around on this several times, and you belong in the organization that we are uh, talking about, but you, and you can belong it to it given your position uh, that we, we have to transform corporate culture. But I think we're going to have that debate, and I, we have to continue to have that debate. Our greatest aspiration is not to get on the Charlie Rose show. I know you know that. Um, it's nice that Rick, that Rick Wolf got on the Charlie Rose show and also got on Bill Moyers, who's much more closely aligned to our position than, than, than Charlie Rose. But at the same time, I'm talking about day in and day out. There's no chance in the mainstream media, there's no chance mm. that people who have things to say, like Cornell West, like yeah. Rick Wolf, yeah. like Chris Hedges and so on, You're are sorry. going to be able, well, myself, yeah, 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 are going to be able to say things and, and continually uh, discuss, have the salon environment of discussing issues and discussing controversial issues. We need to have our own institutions. Now, here's a suggestion. If we could raise money, that is to say enough money to sponsor a television show of our own, I have a, um, uh, a bel I believe that CUNY TV would be hard to turn us down. I believe it would be, uh, CUNY TV, which is New York City, is channel 75 everywhere in New York City, yes, yes. But, you have, but, they, but they are basically a contract shop. Um, they do have some very good programs. Upstate New York, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the station that comes out of Albany, uh, AMC, has an, uh, an alternative radio show that uh, uh, comes on once a week. When I live upstate, which is three months in, of the year in, this, uh, in the June, July, and August period, and sometimes I go up on weekends, that radio show, uh, uh, alternative radio it's called, and it comes largely out of San Francisco, I think, is on, the, is, is on the show. We don't even have that alternative radio show being broadcast here, but we could actually create either and or radio and television with the money that we can raise. At the same time, we should not underestimate whether there would be some unions and their pension funds, but particularly union that pay money to the Democratic Party who would transfer some part of it to a progressive uh, uh, radio or television show uh, where labor's interest might coalesce with the interest of larger groups of the population. Um, the, 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 we have a, another problem, and I want to I pose this because it's something that is, is often uh, ignored or rarely spoken of. Uh, we, we, we on the left, as well as the left liberals who I encounter, who I, I call part of the left, we on the left are worshippers of stars. We are, we will name the Cornell Wests and we will name the Chris Hedges and we will name the, the this ones and the that ones. <laughs> And uh, we, we're very glad that uh, Richard Wolf gets on Charlie Rose. We have to be very careful. The success of a social movement that we're talking about will be measured not by whether the stars get on to mainstream radio and television, because they will get on if they do constitute a threat. And if they don't, and they'll only constitute a threat if they're part of a movement that is capable of raising questions on a consistent basis, raising questions publicly, and reaching out to audiences that compete with the, with the mainstream and compete with the Democratic Party politically. And so far, we're not competing. We're, we're folded into both, uh, to, into both uh, venues, to, into the main, main, mainstream, although we have certain uh, alternatives, and folded into the, to, to the Democratic Party. It's a serious problem. Uh, to get people to think once more, as we thought about it in the turn of the 20th century, that was a period from 1900 to 1912, or, or actually 24, that we can have an independent pol pol politics. And that was at that time beginning, it was a socialist politics in the 1920s. The A Favelle supported in 1924 the candidacy of Robert La, La Follette yeah. against both the Democrats and Republicans on a progressive party yeah. ticket. In 19 from Minnesota, Wisconsin? Wisconsin. Okay. In 1948, the, the, the unions supported the Cold War and 
supported the Cold War president, who was Harry Truman, and uh, refused to support the third-party candidacy of Henry Wallace. Most of them refused in, 19, in the 1970s and 80s to get behind Jesse Jackson, who ran in the Democratic Party primary and had very few supporters among the unions. We have, we have serious problems. And uh, part of the problem is ourselves. And, and, uh, and, and that is that we have so long been uh, uh, losers, that is to say, and been marginalized, that the idea that we could not become a majority, that is a long, long ways off, but that we could become a substantial and a uh, influential minority, that idea has to continually be re repeated over and over and over again. The other thing I want to mention is that it is true that we have good uh, sociologists, and we have good economists, and we have good um, anthropologists. But one of the things that characterizes a genuine left is that we break down those disciplinary boundaries. That it's possible for a Rick Wolf to talk about art. When I hear Rick Wolf talk about art, I know we've begun to arrive. Oh. When I when I when, when I spoke when I spoke with John Jay uh, uh, this past week, I spoke to the economics department, by the way, and I'm uh, allegedly a sociologist. Um, uh, when I when you talk about George Lukacs, George Lukacs is not an economist; he's a philosopher. Mm. And I talk about George Lukacs; he's a philosopher. Mm. And I will talk about the Frankfurt School in my course, who, which is a, all of whom, most of whom anyway, were philosophers. Mm. So that the point of the disciplines is always to segregate people. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're not an economist, you can't talk about the economy. If you're not an art historian, you can't talk about art history. That's silly. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that's just silly. Yeah. Yeah. And those views separate us even more. And we need that's that broad your, vision. That, the, vision. That's right. That brings us together. That's, that's, that's right. Now, what you're talking about. Now, the, 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 one of the leaders of the spiritual progressives, Michael Lerner, mm -hmm. uh, who just had an article online that I read, which was a pretty good article on the economy. Uh, he's a philosopher. He's also a rabbi. Mm -hmm. So he's a religious figure, but he's also his, his background is philosophy. I would love for Michael Lerner, my old friend Michael Lerner, to actually start talking about philosophy again, right. as well as to talk about the economy. But he has that vision. Mm -hmm. He's a clinical psychologist, too. Y yeah. So yeah. He's Michael, Lerner, Michael Lerner is a critical psychologist. And the point, obviously, is that Lerner does not make it uh, a, 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 a specialty to say, I'm a rabbi, and therefore that's what I think. He, he's, he's commenting on a larger, uh, in a larger canvas. And if we had more people who were willing to entertain that kind of uh, scope and that kind of breadth, then we would begin to have much more influence because we would say to ourselves, we are the people, and the people have a right to have judgments about virtually anything that affects their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley, for that. And we all, in terms of one, one aspect of uh, Stanley's biography that's very interesting is that uh, was almost completely self-taught. And I think that's inspiring for our viewers to know people who have not gotten a real education that you can read books, you can learn. And, and, and as Stanley wound up you know, getting a degree and wrote a long paper and they uh, used a lot of your publications. Um, no, I didn't use any publications. Oh. No, I, I, what happened was that I, because of my publications, they gave me a bachelor's degree at the, at the new school without going to school. Okay. And, uh, but but I, I did write a PhD dissertation at a place called Union Graduate School that did not require me to go to classes because I get jittery when I'm in classes of people that I don't necessarily think I'm learning anything from. Okay, okay. Uh, final reflection uh, from Jim. Let's get on with this uh, restructuring of this culture. Let's get on to some of the ideas that Stanley and John have been talking about. We're all with you. And we invite our public also to be a part of this, to be part of this dialogue and to not give up hope. I think the hope is that uh, this can go on and, and uh, so love is also very important. We want to create a world that's more caring and loving and peaceful and kind and that's where the spiritual element comes in. The critical, I'm glad that Stanley talked about Michael Lerner because, you know, there's a, I think we can get a dialogue with Stanley and Michael Lerner. That would be very interesting. Okay. And final, final thought from Stanley? No, no, I... I think, I think we have to stop, um, how shall I put it, we have to stop with the praise. 
Yeah. We, we have to understand that what is going on here in this salon, as well as what needs to be done going forward, is to think about how does a movement based on the anonymous rather than the famous develop? If we fall victim to fame and to fortune and to um, uh, people who get on the media and people who are well known as our leaders, we have lost a tremendous amount. Uh, what we lose is the is the power empowerment of ourselves. The point of the movement is that people who have lived their ordinary lives and are being screwed by the system, mm. those are the people who need to be empowered. Amen and right on. <laughs> Thank you all uh, for watching us on the Public Voice Salon uh, here at the home of uh, Jim and Beatty uh, with Stanley Aronowitz, uh, the public intellectual. Thank you. Thank you.